Hi, I'm Dan Stancil, and in this video, I would like to talk about states on the Bloch sphere. Or more specifically, where does this equation come from? It shows up in almost all introductions to quantum computing, but usually with very little explanation about where it comes from, other than identifying theta and phi as angles on the Bloch sphere. If you've begun to look into quantum computing, you probably know that zeros and ones are represented by quantum states denoted by the ket notation shown here. However, a key difference between classical and quantum computing is that a quantum bit or qubit can not only be zero or one, but can also be in a superposition state that is a mixture of zero and one. A general superposition state is usually written in the form shown here and visualized as a vector pointing to the surface of the block sphere with angles theta and phi. Any single qubit state can be represented by a unit vector directed from the origin to a point on the sphere. And the action of single qubit gates can be visualized as rotations of the state along the surface of the sphere. As I indicated in the first slide, the question that I would like to address in this video is, where does this equation come from? Before we get started, you may notice some unexpected aspects of how states are represented on the Bloch sphere. For example, we know the state zero and one are orthogonal to one another. That is, their inner product gives zero. However, these states are depicted as collinear on the Bloch sphere. If we were talking about normal vectors in a 3D space, zero would be represented by a unit vector pointing along the plus C axis, and one would be represented by a unit vector pointing along the minus C axis. So in terms of classical vectors, the inner product would simply be the dot product, which is not zero. So it's important to keep in mind that this is simply a visualization tool. It is not an accurate depiction of the state vector in a conventional Cartesian vector space. To understand where this equation comes from, we need to understand rotations. You may have encountered rotations in a classical physics or mechanics class. So we'll begin with a brief review of rotations of classical vectors in three space. However, in quantum mechanics, the physical state is represented by the state vector. So we ultimately need to understand how these state vectors are rotated. Consider the rotation of a classical vector around the z-axis by the angle theta in the counterclockwise direction, as shown in this diagram. From the geometry of the figure, we see that the vector of length r, originally along the x-axis, rotates into uh, a vector with x component r cosine theta and y component r sine theta. Following a similar construction, a, very, uh, a vector of length r along the y-axis would rotate into a vector with x component minus r sine theta and y component plus r cosine theta. In general, we can write the possible rotations in matrix form. We refer to the square matrix as the rotation matrix for rotations about the z-axis. Here the superscript C indicates a classical physics rotation. Following similar procedures, rotations about the x and y axis are described by the matrices shown here and here. In quantum mechanics, vector quantities are obtained by taking the expectation value of vector operators for a specific quantum state. For example, to determine the direction of an electron spin, we take the expectation value of the spin operator using the electron's state vector. To rotate the measured spin vector, we need to rotate the electron state vector in such a way that the vector obtained by taking the expectation rotates in the manner we expect. As mentioned above, it is sometimes helpful to refer to electron spin as an example, but our discussion applies to any two-state quantum mechanical system. In this discussion, consider the general vector operator A, where x hat, y hat, and z hat 
refer to unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction respectively. Ax then refers to the matrix component of A that operates along the x-axis and similarly for Ay and Az. For the quantum, say, psi, the expectation of A is denoted by sandwiching the operator between the bra and ket of the state vector as shown here. Now suppose we would like to rotate the system so that the expectation vector rotates by an angle theta in the counterclockwise direction around the z-axis as we had in our illustration. We want to find a unitary operator u that gives the rotated state psi prime when u is applied to psi and the expectation evaluated with a rotation state is the same as what would be obtained by applying the classical rotation matrix to the unrotated expectation vector. Remember that a unitary operator is one for which the permission conjugate is the inverse, that is u dagger u equals one, and the permission conjugate is obtained by taking the transpose and then taking the complex conjugate of, a, of an operator. Substituting in for psi prime leads to the conclusion that u dagger u, u dagger a u, must give the same result as multiplying uh, the vector operator by the classical rotation matrix. Here we have used the fact that the rotation matrix can be moved inside the bracket, which is easily verified by direct calculation. We have also used the fact that taking the conjugate transpose of a product is the same as taking the conjugate transpose of each factor and reversing the order. To simplify our consideration of rotations, let's consider an infinitesimal rotation epsilon about the axis n hat, the unit vector in the desired axis of rotation. In this case, we anticipate that u will differ only slightly from the identity operator. So to first order in small quantities, we can express u with uh, two terms in a Maclaurin series. Here, sigma is an arbitrary Hermitian vector operator that is yet to be determined. Remember that a Hermitian operator A is one for which A dagger equals A. The fact that sigma is Hermitian along with the coefficient i on the second term ensures that u is indeed unitary to first order in epsilon. Note, we could have absorbed the factor of one half into the so far unspecified sigma, but including it explicitly as shown here will lead us to the definition of sigma that is most commonly used. For the case of a rotation around the z-axis, the x component of the rotated operator is given by this calculation. On the right-hand side of the first line, we have used the small angle approximations to the elements of the rotation vector RC. That is, cosine epsilon is approximately one, and sine of epsilon is approximately equal to epsilon. Going from the second to the third line, we have neglected terms of second order in epsilon. The square bracket notation on the last line is called a commutator and simply means sigma z ax minus ax sigma z as shown in the previous line. Now, if ax and sigma z were ordinary numbers, this last equation would imply that ay equals zero since ordinary numbers commute. However, if these operators are represented by matrices, then more general solutions can exist since matrix multiplication is not commutative in general. Similar calculations for the y and z components of the expression we are evaluating lead to these additional commutators involving sigma z and ay and sigma z and az. Rotations about the x and y axes lead to additional commutation relations as shown here. Since these commutation relations were obtained without restrictions on the vector operator A, they must also be satisfied if we let A equal sigma. 
This leads to the commutation relations for the components of sigma as shown here. We conclude that for our trial operator to properly rotate a quantum state vector, the components of the vector operator, sigma, must satisfy these commutation relations. You can easily verify by the direct substitution that the matrices shown below satisfy these commutation relations. In physics, these matrices are called the Pauli matrices, and they are identical to the X, Y, and Z gate matrices used in quantum computing. The gate notation is commonly used when quantum circuits are being discussed, while the Pauli notation is often used when the Hamiltonian of a physical system is being constructed that is, the operator for the total energy of the system. So far, we have seen how to perform infinitesimal rotations. What about finite rotations? Let's consider the case of multiple small rotations resulting in an equivalent large rotation. In other words, we apply the rotation operator for the infinitesimal rotation epsilon in times with epsilon approximately equal to theta divided by n, where uh, we want to achieve the uh, large rotation theta. The equivalent unitary operator for the total rotation can be approximated by the expression shown here. In the limit n goes to infinity, we obtain a closed form expression for the unitary operator for the rotation of, a quantum, of quantum states as shown here. It may seem a bit strange to have matrices as arguments to the exponential function, but this is simply defined by the conventional Maclaurin series shown here. With a little manipulation involving separating the terms into even and odd powers, this can be written in a form that is often used in quantum computing. This calculation is a bit tedious, but it can be found in most introductory texts on quantum mechanics. This equation enables us, enables us to easily construct two by two matrices for rotations around the principal axes. Note that these have a similar appearance to classical rotation matrices, but the rotation angle enters as theta by two instead of theta. A consequence of this is that a rotation of 2 pi doesn't return to the same state, but rather the negative of the starting state. However, since the measured expectation values are proportional to the magnitude squared of the state vector amplitude, the sign change has no measurable result. Now consider a state vector pointing along the z-axis represented by the ket with a zero. The state vector can be rotated into any other direction represented by a point on the unit sphere with two rotations. First, rotate an angle theta about the y-axis, and then an angle phi about the z-axis. Multiplying out the matrices and simplifying leads to the expression on the last line. Since an overall phase will not affect a measurement, we can represent any single qubit state psi as this final expression. The term global phase or overall phase is used to describe a phase that affects both basis states. Two quantum states that differ only by a global phase are indistinguishable. The term local phase or relative phase is used to describe a phase difference between the two basis states. Two quantum states with different local phases are distinctly different states. Usual practice is to associate the phase only with the one component, but it's not a requirement. It's the difference in phase between the two uh, components that is relevant. To confirm that this works the way we think it should, let's calculate the expected value of the x component of the spin vector operator. First, let's expand the state psi on the right. Then the operator's sigma x can be cleared by recognizing that an x gate simply flips the qubit state. Next, we expand the transpose state on the left 
and simplify using the orthogonality of the state 0 and 1. Factoring out the product of sine theta by 2 cosine theta by 2 allows us to group the exponential terms into the cosine of phi. Finally, simplifying with a trig identity, shown at the bottom, gives us the expected expression for the projection of the unit vector with direction theta phi onto the x-axis. And that's where the equation comes from. When you take the expectation value, you end up with products of cosine theta by 2 and sine theta by 2, which when you apply a trig identity reduces to the sine theta factor that you need for the classical rotation.